Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Generations Family Health Center for hosting today's session, Pediatric uh, Atopic Dermatitis with Dr. Howard Pride. Dr. Pride has been practicing pediatric dermatology since the early 90s at Guy Singer in Pennsylvania, where he served as a chairman of the dermatology department for six years. He is the co-author of a textbook of pediatric dermatology and has published numerous peer review articles and book chapters. Additionally, Dr. Pride has been the director of Camp Discovery PA, formerly Camp Horizon, a camp for children with chronic skin disease, diseases since its inception in 1995 and has been the chairman for the American Academy of Dermatology's Camp Discovery. He has received presidential citations and the AAD Golden Triangle Award for his work with CAMP and was also past president of the Society for Pediatric Dermatology. And we are very lucky to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Pride, when you're ready, please begin. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Um, my first slide I'm presuming is, is up. Um, there, uh, I have no uh, conflicts of interest at all to uh, disclose. We will be talking about products. Uh, so there will be some uh, names of pharmaceuticals, but again, I have no conflict of interest with it, with any of these. Uh, and this is an accredited program for one hour of uh, category one credit. All right, so the disclaimers are done. So we're, we're gonna be talking about pediatric atopic dermatitis, a, a, a topic that is definitely near and dear, I, I will admit not always dear to my heart uh, and makes up an immense part of my program day after day after day. So I know that this is a condition that's common enough where those of you in primary care have to be seeing this. So this is not a talk that's gonna be theoretic and inapplicable to your practice. This is something that you will be able to take right back to the clinic and hopefully be able to manage some of these patients uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it's expensive and difficult for the patients to be referred to a dermatologist. I suspect that like our area, access to dermatology and pediatric dermatology is difficult. Um, and these are fun patients to treat because they're miserable and you can make them better. Um, so, you know, in, in January in particular, out in the waiting room, this little guy is sitting next to this guy who's next to this guy who is next to this one who I just saw, next to this one who I'm about to see, next to this one who uh, is finishing up my day. A atopic dermatitis is a huge part of my life. And just to illustrate even more, this rosy-cheeked little infant with um, obvious atopic dermatitis and now as an adult with uh, exercise-induced asthma is me. That's little Howie. Um, so not only part of my practice, but part of my very being. So, you know, what, what even is atopic dermatitis? So you look in books and you get these kind of bizarre uh, definitions like this, a complex genotypic diathesis that manifests as a syndrome of immunologic aberrations. Crystal clear, right? Um, but if you were kind of charged in clinic with like a medical student who's following you around, they say, everybody talks about atopic dermatitis. What do you, what do you mean by that? It's hard to put into words. But this is a definition that I can get my arms around to give you some idea of what I mean by this condition. And they're highlighted here, kind of the key point. So atopic dermatitis is a chronic cutaneous condition. Um, so unlike poison ivy dermatitis, you know, that comes and goes and so forth, this is something that's ongoing, characterized almost always by early age of onset. And we'll talk about this later, but about five years of age or younger, generally younger than that with severe pruritus. Uh, if a rash doesn't itch, you're on thin ice calling it atopic dermatitis with dry, easily irritated skin, which may be eczematous, especially in childhood, maybe manifest by lichenified flexural lesions. We'll talk about that in adolescence and adulthood. So it's a little bit wordy. If you wanna, I, I like dumbing things down because that's the way I tend to look at the world. It's a chronic itchy rash that isn't scabies. It can be that simple. Uh, and, and for me, for the most part, I walk in the room and before I've introduced myself, I can look at a, the child on her mom's lap and tell this is somebody with atopic dermatitis. It, it isn't for the most part that complicated, but if you wanna make this a little bit more sophisticated, 
It's a chronic itchy rash that isn't scabies, but follows a pretty characteristic distribution pattern in certain ages and is associated with a family history of atopy. Now, you kind of have to know what atopy is to really be able to understand the definition. So atopy is this combination of dermatitis, having a tendency towards hives, tendency towards seasonal or environmental allergies. So that's going to be plaguing everybody here in a few weeks when the flowering trees start to come out. Reactive airways. And, you know, this is more of an allergist component of the definition, but multiple positive uh, prick tests as well. But basically the four, dermatitis, hives, seasonal allergies, reactive airways, or, uh, or asthma. So a given individual might have that. Or as you go through the family history on both sides of the family, there might be cousins, aunts, uncles, parents, siblings that, that have various combinations of that. So when we talk about the characteristic, characteristic distribution by age and the typical morphology, what are we talking about? So in young infants, very facial, uh, but it can be pretty much head to toe. So a lot of these are kids that have cradle cap or seborrheic dermatitis on the scalp as well, but very, very facial. Uh, in infancy, but generalized pretty much all over the body. Um, a morphology that I want to point out is a little bit of an aside here. On people of color, um, it can be a little bit more confusing. So in my area, central Pennsylvania, relatively homogeneous Caucasian population with, without much African skin. But on dark skin, African, Asian skin, Indian skin, you, it's much more palpable. So this is uh, papular atopic dermatitis. So you have to recognize that as a morphology, um, not unique to dark skin, but definitely much more co common in African skin. And then as, as young infants go to toddlers, much, much more flex, uh, flexural. So this is popliteal fossa, brachial fossa would be the other, uh, other area there. And then as young children, if they don't grow out of their eczema, turn into middle school students and high school students, much, much more eyelid dermatitis and hand dermatitis. That's sort of the natural progression of this, facial, flexural, and then grow out of it is actually the norm. But those who do carry it into older age, hand dermatitis and eyelid dermatitis. There are more scientific based criteria for making this diagnosis that I think is much more applicable to the research world where you have to absolutely have highly uh, specifically diagnosed atopic dermatitis, say if you're doing a clinical trial on a medication. The major feature here is the ones to kind of take home. It should itch. Again, if it doesn't itch and I'm calling it atopic dermatitis, I'm on thin ice. The typical morphology we just went through, chronic or chronically relapsing. It's not an acute episode that then goes away and never comes back again. Um, and helpful to have a personal or family history of atopy. And again, atopy is eczema, seasonal allergies, asthma, tendency towards hives. And then there's a number of minor criteria as well. I'm going to go through these very fast because it's going to be easier for me to show you pictures of them than it is to kind of digest a, a list of words. Dry skin, ichthyosis, keratosis pilaris, um, and a, a number of other things here as well. Again, it's a list to show you that there is a list, uh, but again, it's, it's easier to show you in pictures than to, to kind of give a list. And if you wanna kind of put, bring it down a little bit more digestible, if you will, these are criteria that were developed later. So you have to have an itchy skin disease. If you don't have that, then again, that's really hard to call it atopic dermatitis if it doesn't itch. And then three of the following, history of flexural eczema, history of asthma or rhinitis, dry skin in the past year or so, onset before 12 years of age, and visible flexural dermatitis. Again, this is important in the research world. In the real clinical world, for the most part, I walk into the room and I know within three steps of, of entering that this is somebody that, that likely has atopic dermatitis. So in many respects, it's like putting a puzzle together with many characteristics, some of them more important than others. And if you have enough of the characteristics, the picture comes into focus. And even if you have a piece or two missing, 
you can tell it's the ocean with a lighthouse and you've made your diagnosis. So ichthyosis is a big part of this with many people, particularly Caucasians, but in all races. So you look at the palms and it's hyperlinear. That's somebody that's got ichthyosis vulgaris, dry, an inherited dry skin. And on their legs, it might look like that, particularly in the winter time or on their tummy, kind of this, this dryness. Um, lots and lots and lots of people have keratosis pilaris that don't have eczema, but lots of people with eczema have keratosis pilaris as well. This with that characteristic red cheek, keratosis pilaris rubra facii, if you really want to give it a nice Latin sounding name, but just regular old KP. Chicken skin, you know, is what a lot of people will call that. Generally in the back of the arms and the thighs is the other location with it. Very unsatisfying condition to treat. So I, I, if I make a little diversion here, we'll talk about keratosis pilaris. Keratolytics like ammonium lactate, salicylic acid, glycolic acid, little bit of effect. Basically, nothing really works. It doesn't itch all that bad and it gets better in high school. So it's one of the most unfulfilling diagnoses that I make because everybody's disappointed with the results that we get with things that we suggest. Um, again, in infants, these red shaped cheeks with a little bit of pallor around the mouth. Some what tend to get referred to as allergic shiners, the darkness under the eyes, but the hyperlinearity under the eyes as well, what are called Denny Morgan lines. Here you really see it accentuated in an adult with very chronic ongoing dermatitis. Now that the weather's starting to warm up, our Caucasian population will start coming out of the woodwork with a little bit of tan, but these areas that don't tan well. So I, I suspect you recognize this as pityriasis alba, uh, generally an eczema association. Uh, juvenile plantar dermatosis, foot dermatosis, generally an eczema variant. Uh, a little bit older patient here. Why is it a tinea? Generally, you look between the toes, and if they're normal, you've got a foot like that, and between the toes is normal, it's not going to be tinny. It's not going to be fungus. Fungus loves the moistest, wettest area. So even without doing a KOH or any diagnostic test, you can usually tell from there. So this is pretty classic uh, juvenile plantar dermatosis. This is what we mean by lichenification, sometimes described as washboard thickening of the skin. Now, who on earth even knows what a washboard is? It's not the greatest analogy when, when you can't even conjure up an image of that. You have to be like 100 years old. Anyway, that's what a washboard looks like. And when you look at it, it's, it's fairly, uh, fairly appropriate. And this is more typical of what you'll see. You know, really wrist, back of the neck are two areas where you'll see kind of thickening and hyperlinearity of the, of the skin. It's not a primary finding. That's just from somebody scratching a lot. And distinct nodules of scratching, parigo nodules, somebody with uh, chronic kidney disease that's been scratching the bejeebers out of their legs, multiple parigo nodules, just as an as a illustration. Impetigo, a secondary infection, a staph infection on top of the skin. Now, this is run-of-the-mill regular old impetigo that'll be rolling into the clinic in June, July, August when the weather gets hot. This is more of what I'm talking about with secondary infection and eczema. Lots and lots and lots of primary atopic dermatitis, but this more juicy, oozy area, that's what you're going to see in your atopic patients when they're infected. You know, it's not so much scaling erythema or dryness anymore. It's got a lot of oozing and exudation to it. Um, you mollusca, the bane of my existence, something that every child will get someday. Again, these are typical kind of non-inflamed mollusca. You recognize the umbilicated papules there. But again, when we're talking about eczema, this is more what you see with eczema. The mollusca kind of clustering on the eczematized skin, in this case, the brachial fossa. And a little bit harder to, to pick out, you know, because this is some, somebody that's been scratching and scratching. So you don't get those nice, distinct umbilicated papules. But you can tell something's going on. Um, and the umbilic uh, uh, the, these umbilicated lesions characteristic of, of mollusca can really set off the, the atopic dermatitis. So it's, a, it's kind of a vicious cycle. You get eczema, which means you get worse mollusca. The worse mollusca give you worse eczema. So while I love to leave mollusca alone, this might be a setting where I'd at least be tempted to maybe do something like cryo or cantharidin or something to get rid of them to kind of make it a little bit easier to treat the, the uh, eczema. 
And again, this is primary herpes simplex, terrible herpes simplex, probably somebody that's got their first episode and has absolutely no antibodies against it. But this is more of what you're going to see with herpes simplex in the setting of eczema, what we call eczema herpeticum, underlying eczema with herpes on top of it that just spreads like wildfire. And you get these little um, distinct papules, pustules, vesicles that then erode and leave kind of scalloped edges uh, as an end result. Really, really terrible condition and many times warrants uh, admission to the hospital. And this is an example of white dermatographism. Contrast that with typical dermatographism hives. White dermatographism, you don't get that clear. I don't use that as a diagnostic test, but it's kind of interesting with some of the kids in the clinic, they've been scratching and scratching and scratching, and they'll have a hive like this, the, the edematous wheel without the erythematous flare. Kind of an interesting uh, characteristic of atopic dermatitis. But again, that's your run-of-the-mill person with, with hives. There is a differential diagnosis to this. Uh, and for my residents, when I'm talking about atopic dermatitis, I really expect them to have a pretty good knowledge of what each one of these conditions is, even though they're very rare. It, it's important for those of us that make a living seeing skin to know it's probably eczema, but in the back of my mind, I have to know that maybe it's something else because the majority of these, particularly as you get down on the list, are like one in a million diagnoses. For you, I think if it's not eczema, it's scabies. And the, the differential diagnosis can be that simple. So when I'm seeing a little guy like this, I'm wondering, is that eczema? or is that scabies? The first thing I will do is look at the palms and salt because that's the easiest place to see Burroughs uh, characteristic of, of scabies. So this is a little bit unfair. This is a little guy that was treated with topical steroids. So it's like Burroughs everywhere. Um, so that's not gonna be your typical patient, but it makes for a good illustration for a talk. And I've got the liberty in my clinic to be able to scrape a few of those and see a mite under the microscope or pull out my dermatoscope. I can actually see it with magnification grossly on the child. For you, you've got to rely on a, on a little bit more clinical suspicion. But when you've got these distinct little papules, uh, sometimes pustules and vesicles, particularly if they're linear, um, then you've got to suspect scabies. But if it's not scabies, it's probably going to be eczema little bit more expanded differential diagnosis. You see the epicenter of the eczema here is right about the belt line. This is probably nickel contact uh, dermatitis. I suspect you recognize that really quickly. So either the snap on their pants or more likely the top of their belt buckle uh, they're allergic to. So, you know, that, that expands the differential a little bit more. Seborrheic dermatitis, I, I think that's a subtle difference. Kids with seborrheic dermatitis almost always have atopic dermatitis too. So, you know, if you call seborrheic dermatitis atopic dermatitis or you call atopic dermatitis seborrheic dermatitis, it doesn't really much matter. That's, that you're going to treat them the same. And same with psoriasis. You know, um, it, you're not going to be too far off base if you call that eczema when in fact it's psoriasis because you're going to treat it similar. But to expand even more, these kind of dark brown areas in a sebderm kind of distribution on the scalp is histiocytosis, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, really terrible uh, zinc deficiency, acrodermatitis enteropathica, really rare inherited condition called Netherton syndrome. So, you know, there is some expansion of the differential diagnosis that I need to know as a dermatologist. For you, you walk in the room and you probably know what it is. Take a quick look at the palms and soles. You know, it's scabies or it's eczema. Probably doesn't need to go any further than that. A little bit on epidemiology, because I think this is helpful to know. It is really common. Um, maybe as much as 20%, one in five of your young children population has atopic dermatitis. So I absolutely positively know it's walking into your clinic in a primary care setting. It's just impossible not to. And particularly if you're up in the Northeast in Connecticut where the winters are cold, you know, December, January, February, they're coming out of the woodwork. It's it, For me, it's like every other patient that I see in the winter, a little bit less so in the summer when it's hot. Um, and the incidence is kind of plateaued, but for many years it had been increasing, and, and who knows why. Um, there's these series of hygiene, vaccination, diet, um, it not really known. 
one thing that's important to kind of tuck away in your your memory bank is about 90 percent of children will have their atopic dermatitis by five years of age so it's not that i i never make the diagnosis and say a 10 year old who for the first time is starting to get dermatitis but it makes me think a little bit it's at least a mental speed bump that i may be on the wrong track with calling it atopic dermatitis but still 10 percent of the population will get their atopic dermatitis as at an older age. Um, pathogenesis. I, I only want to spend a little bit of time on this because the bottom line is it helps me explain to patients and parents why this is chronic and ongoing. So the first genetic abnormality that really was distinctly linked to atopic dermatitis was the gene for ichthyosis vulgaris, common dry skin or phylogrin. And about 50% of people that have a phylogran abnormality with dry skin also have atopic dermatitis. The first one that really truly linked a genetic abnormality to atopic dermatitis. Now, there are lots of other candidate genes that have various effects on barrier function as well as immune dysregulation. And this is just, an, this is starting to get a little dated here now to uh, 11 years old. But GWAS studies looking at a huge population of patients with atopic dermatitis versus those that don't have atopic dermatitis. And there are a lot of genetic abnormalities that are candidates for this. And again, it's not that important that you know specifically what they are. But the concept that I try to get to parents is this is a part of your child's genetic makeup. You know, this is not going to be like treating strep throat or an ear infection. It's not going to be a finite 10 day period of, say, antibiotics or cream or whatever, and you're cured. This is part of your genetic makeup. This is the same way as you have blue eyes rather than brown eyes. The reason you have kinky hair instead of straight hair, all the things that make us genetically who we are, eczema is part of that. So I'm never surprised when a parent says, This cream was great, but every time I stop it, the eczema comes back. Well, you know, genetically, you're the same person that got us into this mess in the first place afterwards as you were beforehand. So it's not that important that you know the specific gene or that we know the gene, but the concept of that this is part of your genetic makeup is an important thing that I try to get through to parents. And it's likely that it's a gene that involves barrier function or a gene that involves some component of immune regulation. Now, to make it even more nuanced is you can have a genetic abnormality that primarily involves um, immune regulation, in this case, IL-25, that results in a phylogran barrier dysfunction so that the immunologic ab aberration can result in a, a, a barrier dysfunction and vice versa. So it's a little bit more nuanced than it's a barrier function versus an immune dysregulation. It's, it's definitely components of both. But if you go to lectures, you know, particularly if it's an immunologist talking about it, you get slides like this that just make my brain explode. But again, it's the concept that I'm trying to get down that this is part of your genetic makeup. We're not gonna cure your eczema. We can get it better. You'll probably grow out of it but it is gonna be a chronic ongoing problem. Um, so we're, we're kind of come full circle. Now let's talk about really, the, this, is, this is the beef of the talk of, we've made the diagnosis, we've at least gone through the mental gyration of there could be a differential diagnosis. Now we wanna treat it. And how are we gonna do that? Well, why is it important? This is, this is a quote from a, a paper that now, it, you know, the, Kim's like 40 years old now, but she was a, uh, we watched her grow up in town and she had relatively significant eczema. And in a paper that she wrote for middle school, talks about, you know, the physical pain associated with, with eczema, the, the pain and the cracks in your feet and that sort of thing. But it, likewise, the emotional toll uh, that this can take on as well. So very, very, very important condition to recognize and then to treat. So we're gonna talk about five things basically, and this is how I introduce the discussion with the parents. So everything I'm telling you is exactly what I do in the exam room as well. We're gonna talk about five things. So one is education, of um, things that are gonna be important that you do to prevent flares. And, and in short, 
uh, the the kind of Reader's Digest version of that is chemical free, no dryer sheets, no fabric softener, free and clear detergents, soaps that have no fragrance at all. Try to avoid any kind of lotion or soap that says baby on it because most of them are going to have fragrances. Um, so that's number one, chemical free, but education in general. Uh, lots of emollients, the real key anti-inflammatory agents, and there'll be a minor role for antihistamines and antibiotics that we'll talk about. So that's the introduction to the parents. I will say we're going to talk about five things, and I've got a handout that for me on Epic is just a, an electronic thing that I blow into the patient information uh, that they get when they, they walk out. And I'll say, you don't have to have an encyclopedic memory of everything I'm gonna say. Everything I'm gonna say is gonna be repeated in the handout because there's an awful lot to this uh, to digest. And for me, 15 minutes to get through an appointment of get the story, do the exam, talk about the condition diagnostically, talk about it therapeutically is, is tough. So a lot of it de depends on handouts. So chemical free, lots of emollient, anti-inflammatory. We'll talk about that specifically. Little bit of a role for antihistamines and antibiotics. So there are lots of uh, resources for education. The National Eczema Association is a great resource. Um, if you uh, get on the uh, website of the Rady Children's Hospital Eczema Center, they've got videos and handouts and such. There's this cool little book that I'll give people the reference to. It, it used to be underwritten by a, uh, by a pharmaceutical company and I'd have actually the books that I could give, but I can at least direct them to the, the website. But really the, the key features I wanna get through because you can absolutely blitz people with a lot of information is this is the way you are genetically programmed to be. You're hyper reactive to the environment it, it's not gonna be as simple as 10 days of antibiotics for an ear infection, but we can treat it well and we can do it safely, um, but I'm not gonna cure it. It's not gonna be a finite period of time and you're done. But the silver lining to this whole thing is it probably will get better. Somewhere around kindergarten age, you're probably gonna grow out of it. So key features of education, again, we're gonna talk about those five things repetition, just to kind of lock that into your brain. Um, environmental control I, or, or food control in particular, if I can get in and out of the visit without even mentioning foods, that's a great thing. Um, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. If somebody's really keyed in on foods, I might direct them to allergy just to share the pain of this. And if they want to just, even without testing, avoid the most likely things, if you take out milk, eggs, peanuts, and you could add soy as well, you've eliminated basically 90% of, of the food allergy uh, with just those simple things. Now, egg is not so simple because it's everywhere. Um, but again, food is not generally the driving force behind the, the, the eczema. And it's not where I'm going to start with a first visit. Um, and again, this is a quote from a, a review article that's starting to become a little bit dated. Um, but the, the end conclusion here is there's no consistent finding regarding the role of dietary restriction in young children. In fact, it, it can be fairly dangerous if they're not getting the, the protein calorie uh, minerals that they need. So when do I get a pediatric allergist involved? You know, if respiratory symptoms and rhinoconjunctivitis are the dominant piece of the picture. The skin's not so bad, but those are bad. That I think is really valuable. If the history really strongly suggests uh, an allergic trigger, you know, where there's absolutely cause and effect there, I think that's worthwhile. If I just cannot get a parent away from persevering over allergic triggers, that's worth getting an allergist involved. And we're doing all the right things. And this is actually the most common scenario. We're doing the right things and, and it's just not, not working. Uh, about bathing, um, there's a little bit of a paradox with this. The joke is that there's a pair of ducks. Um, anyway, they, they, the parents will say, one doctor said I should only bathe once a week. Then I went to another doctor and he said I should bathe every day. Which one is true? Well, in fact, both are true. If you don't put emollient on right afterwards, bathing can be like licking your chapped lips. You bathe, they dry out. They dry, they dry, you get, you get drier. But if you hydrate right after the tub, bathing can be very therapeutic. So I encourage parents to bathe every day 
and immediately, maybe even soaking wet, get the emollient and the, the steroid cream on. Um, I'm just going to go through this very quick uh, because most of this I do is, as a handout rather than something I spend a lot of time in. But, you know, tepid water in and out relatively quickly, nothing abrasive and absolutely no soaps with uh, um, fragrances or chemicals to them. Emollient use, there's a million of them out there. Really important in the winter. I, I would say probably less so when the summer comes. Always right after the tub or shower. Ointments are going to be better than creams. You want to have something that you scoop is going to have less sting to it and is going to feel better on the skin. Is going to have more lasting effect. If you take the perfect moisturizer as one that is cheap, really thick, and really chemical free, you can't beat petrolatum or Vaseline, but there's a million of them out there. Aquaphor, Cetaphil, Eucerin, CeraVe. Um, it, to me, it's not so important what someone is using, it's that they're using it. That, that's the real key. So everybody gets their, their favorites. Parents have introduced me to kind of the Tubby Todd's uh, line. Perfect. Um, if, if they like it and their child will let you put it on, the more the better. Really, the, the key here, though, is proper use of topical steroids. This is really where people get better, and they're not things that you need to be afraid of, you know, particularly used appropriately. And then there are some non-steroid anti-inflammatory agents as well. Traditionally, those have been the calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus and permicrolimus. Uh, Eucrisa is kind of the new one on the, the block, is not a calcineurin inhibitor, but again, has the same advantage of being a non-steroid. But for the most part, the topical steroids are sort of the mainstay of my treatment. Priamcinolone is probably my most common prescription. It, it's inexpensive. It's on everybody's formulary. I, I tend to write for the ointment rather than the cream because it stings a lot less. I tend to use the 0.1%. And this regimen is so ingrained with me. It's it, my standard epic note already has it built into the, the plan so that I don't have to retype it every single time. So triamcinolone liberally daily, once a day is fine, um, for two weeks. And then as a conversion, rather than stopping it, and invariably the eczema comes back, or continuing it and starting to worry about uh, atrophy and that sort of thing. Now, realistically, atrophy is months of use, not weeks of use. Um, then convert over to just Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So three days a week, they use the triamcinolone. Monday through Thursday might have some nuance to it, but usually it's just in my Again, that's so ingrained in the way that I do things, it's built right into my note. I don't even have to type it in. I like ointments better than uh, creams because they're, uh, they add a little bit more emolliency, um, but they also sting a lot less. So for children that are crying every time they're, they're child tries to, or their parent tries to put something on their skin, a, a ointment is great. Uh, for scalp, liquids are nice because they go into a, sol a solution. Most of, most of the products, triamcinolone included, is, is available as a lotion or a solution, except for on African skin. Generally, are going to want an ointment in the scalp. That's, that's hard for a Caucasian, I think, to get their arms around putting an ointment in the scalp but it fits much, much better with their hair care practice and is, and is much better accepted. Uh, you got to prescribe enough. And, you know, I'll get kids into the clinic that prescribe triamcinol, and I think, why on earth is this not working? And it's a little 15-gram tube, which is like one application, and then it's empty. So it, you've got to be bold enough to, to get the right amount. Now, granted, these sizes are adults, so you have to scale them down a little bit. Um, but an 80 gram tube for an infant is very appropriate. And for my older kids, I'll prescribe a good sized one pound jar. Uh, that's not inappropriate. Wet wraps is, is something I'll add on later. Um, it's, it's a little bit time consuming. There's a number of ways of doing it, but the simple way is you come out of the tub, you slather down with triamcinolone, you put wet pajamas, moist pajamas, the way they feel when they come out of the washing machine, that level of moist, and then something over the top, another set of pajamas, a sauna suit or something, something like that. And then you send them off to bed. It's very effective. 
it's really impractical. And then to kind of round off steroids, I, I really try not to use systemic steroids. They're very seductive. They work beautifully. You come off it, you rebound right back to where you were. So it, it's only a quick fix. It only transitions you into topicals. But some kids are so out of control that no matter what you do topically, it hurts too much. Just settle them down with a course of systemic steroids. But again, that's a particular niche. It's not part of my routine care. And this is an easy way of doing wet wraps with Tuba Grip or Tuba Fast is another product. Tuba Fast makes these products that you can order on Amazon. They're pricey, but they're silky smooth, and, and it's a nice way of doing wet wrap therapy. It's a niche. It's not part of my norm. Um, and most everybody just needs this intermittent burst of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then take the weekdays off. But there are a subset of patients that do need something to supplement that other time. And all of you know, there can be top of, uh, there can be side effects of topical steroids. Again, this is more months of treatment rather than weeks of treatment, but you can get atrophy, stria, telangiectasia, can induce perioral dermatitis around the, the, the mouth. You know, I've never seen anybody with hirsutism that was abusing steroids so much, and you can theoretically get suppression of the HP axis. So there are downsides of constantly using topical steroids, which is where a calcium neuron inhibitor comes in. So... Tacrolimus or Pimicrolimus, for whatever reason in Pennsylvania, insurance seems to cover Tacrolimus before Pimicrolimus. It's an ointment, it might sting a little bit less. That's, that's my most common uh, steroid sparing agent. E either one is, is fine. Uh, and there's good evidence to support that they're safe. I'm not gonna go into the black box warning and that sort of thing, but there's a lot of evidence now that the black box warning that came out with this is really not appropriate with many millions of prescriptions with basically no change in lymphoma different than the general population. So that's not something I feel too badly about. But if you summarize my own thoughts with this, prime cinolone or mid-potency topical steroid works really great. You settle it down with a topical steroid, generally two weeks, convert over to weekends, and then uh, add in a, a calcium neuron inhibitor from there. Calcium neuron inhibitors are great for skin folds where you don't really want to use a steroid too much, and they're great for the face. Good role there, but they're expensive and they sting and they don't have the oomph to them that triamcinolone does. Um, for Cibarol, I just don't know quite where to put this. It works okay. It tends to sting when you put it on and my gosh, it's so stinking expensive. I mean, 700 bucks for a 60 gram tube that stings and doesn't work that great. I just haven't found a place for it yet. Um, so I don't want to bash anybody's product, but I, I just don't know that the world needs a cream that doesn't work that great that costs $700. So that, that's my main topical regimen. Now, the rest of the stuff just kind of supplements that. Um, I love this quote. If I don't sleep, nobody sleeps. And while antihistamines have been pro proven to really have minimal, if any, effect on atopic dermatitis, it's just not a histamine-mediated process, the sedation effect that you get from something like hydroxyzine can be really valuable for kids that are scratching themselves to sleep and can help, um, you know, for a period of time, get a little bit better night's sleep. Um, melatonin for sleep. There's some evidence that it works. It's not a big part of my armamentarium. So I, I would not want to give you the impression that I'm a big melatonin user, but it's, a, it's another thing to help with sleep. And there is some evidence that it has some anti-inflammatory effect as well. And then lastly, antibiotics. Um, there's a subset of children like the picture that I showed you before with great deal of secondary infection. So if it's all over the body, I would probably use cephalexin. Um, I might culture once to make sure that they're not methicillin resistant. Mupiracin is a great addition. You're never going to do any harm with, with mupiracin. Um, and, you know, the Clorox uh, bleach baths, I, I think all of you have heard of. Parents think I'm absolutely crazy, although many of them have scoured the internet and have already seen that before I even bring it. I say, you know, it's like jumping into the pool at the YMCA. You know, it's just going into a chlorinated swimming pool. And that can be very valuable as well, but it's a niche. It's not the big part of my, my general way of going through things. And then you get the what comes next. And this is my world, perhaps more than your world. 
but ultraviolet light works really well. You have to come to the clinic to be able to get it done. We have been able to get home units for some people. Very effective, very safe. Other treatments, this used to be my list of, of common immunosuppressive agents, um, but you know, not so much anymore. I built this speed bump into my world to say, all right, we're thinking of a systemic treatment. What might else be going on? So are they actually using it? Have they got some other diagnosis? Are they growing herpes simplex or am I missing allergy? Should I be doing a biopsy? Should I be doing a lab workup? Just to make me think a little bit that I might be on the wrong track. And again, this is my world more so than your world, but just so you know where a doctor might be going when you refer them, this is the smart phrase that I have built into Epic that sort of reminds me of the things that I wanted to check. Uh, and then topicals aren't working, uh, ultraviolet light's not working. We finally have a biologic for children with atopic dermatitis, dupilumab. The results so far have been great. I'm not gonna go into this in great depth um, because we're a little short on time and uh, it's probably my world more than your world or your allergist, but it's FDA approved now down to six months of age, which is spectacular. This is my smart phrase so that I can remember the dosing because it's not on the tip of my tongue. So I just bring that up in, in Epic. Um, but be aware that it is FDA approved now to, down to a very young age for the children with moderate to very severe atopic dermatitis. And for many, it's been absolutely life-changing. And now we're starting to see a proliferation of other medications, other cytokine blockers, and the JAK inhibitors are the new things, both orally as well as topically. I haven't personally written a prescription for any of them yet. I kind of seeing where these pan out and they are outrageously expensive. So to summarize, my typical visit, education, a lot of handouts, but I want to hammer home that we're not going to cure this. Um, the bathing routine, usually it's triamcinolone, use it for two weeks, transfer over to weekends maybe hydroxyzine if they're not a good sleeper, maybe cephalexin or mupirocin if they look secondarily infected, but it's the first three that are the mainstay. And then we'll have some kind of follow-up either by uh, patient portal or in person in a few weeks. Say you're doing a great job trying to encourage them through this terrible time. Might increase the steroid potency if it's being a little stubborn, particularly on the hands and feet. Might add in a calcineurin inhibitor at that point. Uh, and then either give me a call when you need me or, or message me through the patient portal or schedule for follow-up depending on, on how things are going. Um, so that, that for me is atopic dermatitis in a nutshell. Um, I have to admit, I was pretty zoned in here. So if some questions came in, I didn't see them, but it, this is a good time to ask questions if you have any. No, we didn't have any questions come in, so you didn't miss anything. But right. if you do have any questions, uh, you can type them to the Q&A box you, or use the raise hand feature and speak directly with Dr. Pry, or um, I can sit here and ramble until you do answer to ask questions. <laughs> um, and if you think of a question after this session, uh, remember you can always use the VC platform and submit an e-consult and you can get an answer that way. I know sometimes thinking of a question in the moment is a challenge. Okay. For facial eczema, which steroids and formulas are appropriate or safe and for how long? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question and, and one that I get frequently. For a finite period of time, and by that I mean a week to a two weeks or so, you can get away with actually even using a super potent topical steroid. Now, again, that's more my world where I'm sure I've got something that a steroid is appropriate to treat. But triamcinolone for a week to two weeks is not inappropriate. And then shift to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe to Saturday, Sunday. You're always going to be safest with a calcineurin inhibitor on the face. So I'm pretty quick to transfer over to that. But it's not so much side effects of the steroid is, have you really got the right diagnosis? And perioral dermatitis is the mistake I see the most, where if it's pimply around the mouth and using a topical steroid actually plays into it, actually enhances the rash rather than making it better. Um, so even triamcinolone, prescription strength, mid-potency topical steroid is appropriate on the face if you do it for a finite period of time and then get into kind of intermittent bursts of it. 
Um, Long-term side effects of tacrolimus or permicrolimus, now, probably not any. A lot of it's theoretic, uh, has somewhat of an immunosuppressive effect. So particularly in our adult population, using it many, many weeks, months, even years, theoretically um, increased risk of skin cancers because immune surveillance on the skin is a little bit less. And I'm not sure it's actually been seen, but again, that's something that's a little bit of a worry of chronic yearly use. Um, the lymphoma thing with the black box warning, I think has really been laid to rest. Um, so that I'm not worried about at all. And you know, from a practical standpoint, it stings when you put it on. So I, I don't try to settle down a dermatitis with tacrolimus or permicrolimus. Get it settled down with triamcinolone. And then when you're down to fairly normal skin, then use that as your steroid sparing agent. Um, but it, absorption is very minimal. It doesn't penetrate really deeply. Um, systemic levels are almost unheard of outside of the zone of erythroderma or other dermatologic conditions that have totally red skin. Um, and trimcinol around, around the eyes, you know, I always use an ointment around the eyes. And, uh, you know, it's not an ophthalmologic preparation. It's not meant to be put in the eyes. Um, I tend to feel a little bit better if I am using an ophthalmologic steroid right next to the eyelid margin. It, you might have noticed if you prescribe these, these products, they've been hard to come by um, and they're very expensive. And I think for the very minimal amount that the ointment in particular, not the cream, gets rubbed into the eyes, there seems to be minimal, if any, risk. Um, I've never had a bad experience with somebody putting it right next to the eyelid margin. Um, again, if you're talking about chronic treatment, you've got to work in permicrolemus or tacrolemus, probably tacrolemus best with an ointment base around the eyes as part of long-term uh, uh, treatment. Then additional tips for baby eczema. You know, I don't look at infant baby eczema as any different than a one, two, three, four-year-old. My approach is exactly the same. So it's settle it down with a mid to lower potency topical steroid. And again, triamcinolone, there's nothing magic about that. Some people love fluticasone, um, uh, desinide, uh, fluocinolone. You know, it, it, to me, that's just nuanced. But it, basically, my approach is exactly the same. Settle them down with 10 days to two weeks triamcinolone, convert over to weekends, which might be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Saturday, Sunday if needed, on top of an emollient the other day's tacrolimus. So it's, it's, it, there's not much nuance between a baby with eczema and, uh, and a uh, preschooler, elementary school, or teenager. And the <laughs> eyes, I think I, I address. Yeah, I think you got them. I'm going to clear them out just so we don't if any, if any more come in, but thank you. Um, right, yeah, if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to submit them. We have, oh, we have one more. Oh boy, diaper dermatitis, it, it, you know, one of the banes of my existence. I, I, I don't think there's a chief complaint that I dislike more than diaper dermatitis. Um, it's got a fairly broad differential diagnosis. So you want to make sure that you're on the right track. 95% um, of them are just irritancy, usually poop more so than urine. Uh, and you know that because it's the convex rather than the concave surfaces. So you want to rule out yeast, Canada, that's deep in the crevices. You want to make sure you're not dealing with psoriasis or sebderm, although you know that's arguably the same as, as eczema. Uh, and then, you know, the bizarre things of lichen sclerosis, histiocytosis, and so forth. Those are all the things that go through my mind, strep, uh, perianal strep. Um, it, so it, once you've determined that it's irritant diaper dermatitis, lots of barrier. Common mistake that, that parents make is that they don't, that they too aggressively remove the, the, uh, the barrier cream, the zinc oxide barrier cream. So I always have them melted away with uh, mineral oil or some kind of oil and then layer one on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. 
And across the board, regardless of what the cause is, I have them not use commercial diaper wipes. So those are three constants, regardless of the cause. Uh, I tend to get the worst of the worst diaper dermatitis. It's nothing's been working. So I will, I will use a concoction of hydrocortisone, mupirocin, clotrimazole, and a zinc oxide based cream as a cocktail. And it's really shotgun, um, but it's kind of good for what ails you and, and seems to work. Um, but um, don't use me as your go-to person for diaper dermatitis. I, I don't need any more of those. <laughs> there is a question. How do you assess protitis in an infant yeah, too young? That's to a really good question. Um, it, it, to some extent, you surmise. You, you look at somebody with eczema, and it looks like it ought to itch, whether they're scratching or not. It, you can kind of like get a feel for it, but it's amazing how young children can be and be scratching. Um, but I, I don't know that it's key to kind of moving forward with the diagnosis, but especially if you have enough other pieces to the puzzle. Um, but children who are very young do itch. They kind of scooch around on their back. You know, they use their hands to scratch. And I, I don't think it's too hard of an intuitive assessment for a parent even to say, I think this itches. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that that conundrum enters into my process all that much. It's a good question. It's, it's a very thought provoking question, but I don't know that it's, a, it's absolutely crucial to my assessment and moving forward with treatment. Great, thank you. Um, just a reminder that when you close out of this webinar, your CME survey is going to appear on a tab, but if you miss it, it will be in the email tomorrow with this slide deck. And we still have a couple more minutes for uh, more questions. So if anybody does have some, please feel free. Uh, we did have a comment in the chat that said definitely worth getting up early for this session. Thank you. <laughs> All right. all right, well, thank you all for joining us today. And Dr. Pride, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, I, I love the pictures and everything. It was really great. So thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Right. Have a great day, everybody. All right, bye-bye, everyone.